Hello, everyone. My name is Mark Jarvis, and I'm a visiting professor at Manchester Metropolitan University. Welcome to the fifth webinar in this series, which are recorded every other Thursday. Uh, in between these, we host a live meeting with different participants via Zoom with a different topic. To find out what's happening next, please email cpe at mmu.ac.uk or keep an eye on my profile on LinkedIn where I will post a link to register in the next few days. Today, we're going to, of course, start by an update on the virus the pandemic, uh, then move on to the economy and some worrying projections for the UK, which you've probably seen in the newspapers today and yesterday. We'll then focus on SMEs and uh, have a glance at the Spanish SME sector, just for comparison. Finally, focusing on the quickening pace of digital transformation that's going on, or uh, Industrial Revolution 4.0, as some are calling it. And we're also looking at how that will be applied in the fashion sector. So to start with, what I wanted to do was just share my screen, um, some statistics which I think you're probably all familiar with. But this is a snapshot um, as of today, the 11th of June, of where things stand. And whilst obviously a league table is always very upsetting to look at, um, this particular one is sorted by total cases. Um, US, UK, Italy, France, Spain, Belgium, Germany, of course, we're all very familiar with those. But what is very concerning, of course, is, is Brazil being up here um, with uh, almost as, uh, as it's coming from nowhere to having almost as many deaths, as sadly, as we've had in the UK. So there's Brazil, um, Mexico, Iran, India, and Russia, uh, and Peru in these top 15 statistics, which um, just goes to show that I think the pandemic is far from over. We do feel, certainly in, in the European cities, around European countries, that things are under control, um, but it's a reminder that throughout the rest of the world, uh, it's, it's far from that. So coming back to um, the consequences that this pandemic has had on the economy, the OECD released its latest economic outlook this week um, and revealed that the projected impact that the COVID-19 pandemic will have on global global GDP in 2020. Um, it assumes there will be no second wave of infections. Um, and with that assumption in mind, um, it is expected that the global economy will be down 6% on last year. Should we encounter a, um, a double hit scenario, then it could be worse and it could go down further to 7.6%. This chart here really shows the range of impacts that will happen um, as it's projected by the OECD. And of course, um, sadly, you will see at the top of the chart is the UK with the 11.5% drop in GDP. Um, not dissimilar greatly from France, Italy, and Spain, um, but significantly higher than the US and Germany and, and of the global average. So certainly some um, concerns we need to think about here and, and, and watch. Again, we've talked about this many times on these webinars. Is it a V-shaped recovery or a U-shaped recovery? Um, I think these projections show that most people believe it will now be a, a U-shaped economy, a U-shaped recovery. So, of course, that leads on to unemployment. And um, again, using OECD data, 
um, we've seen a, a continued rise, a record rise, in fact, in the unemployment rate of OEC countries from March to April, jumping from 5.5% to 8.4% uh, um, globally. Um, so with an increase of some 18.4 million people. Even more dramatic was the change in the G7 countries, Canada, France, Germany, Italy, Japan, UK, and the US, of course, collectively seeing a doubling of their job loss, going from the 4.6% here up to the 9.1% here. The increases for the countries vary vastly. Um, in Japan, for example, the unemployment rate rose just 0.1% percent to 2.6, while in Canada and the US the increases were far more significant at 5.2 and 10.3 percent respectively. Turning back to the economy, um, I, what we've been seeing in a typical lockdown week uh, during May 2020, we've seen that the economic activity is down roughly 30% of their 2020 levels. So um, this is you know, clearly a shocking number. 23% uh, of businesses temporarily closed or paused with around 60% of businesses that continued to trade in the UK reporting a fall in revenues. So economic activity will recover as lockdown restrictions are lifted, but the speed and patterns are, are highly uncertain and clearly will vary by sector. Overall, we're, we're seeing numbers from 9 to 11% in GDP shrinkage for the UK. So such a fallout in output um, clearly has significant implications for employment. And uh, what we can see is that during lockdown, around 7.6 million jobs are at risk. It's, um, that is all encompassing. It covers permanent layoffs, temporary furloughs, reduction in hours and pay. Um, and of course, the risks are highly skewed. People in places with the lowest incomes are the most vulnerable to job losses. So nearly 50% of all jobs at risk are in occupations learning less than the 10 pound per hour. So um, the question is, uh, what will happen next and when will it get better? Well, the, the, the real thing is, when are we going to return to normal? And uh, an interesting graph here, I think, is um, looking at Manpower Global's latest quarterly survey. Um, where they see, uh, what well, they, they, they asked employers in the UK, you know, when they think hiring will return to the pre-COVID-19 levels in the country. And uh, as you can see here, the majority, um, a, a good 56% um, predict this to occur within the next year. But one in 10 believe there is be little, this is to be a little too optimistic and 14% uh, at the bottom here uh, sadly believe that it will never return to such a situation. For now though, hiring intentions remain down across every major sector and is really at the, one of the lowest points for three decades. So with that sobering news, um, I wanted to touch a little bit on the UK small and medium-sized enterprises, SMEs. Uh, the economic response by the government to the COVID-19 pandemic has seen a vast array of solutions in helping businesses cope with the personal and economic tragedy of the past few months. SMEs are without doubt in a particularly tough situation. Plunging demand has forced them to lay off workers and really many do not have the financial resources to survive in this climate. In many countries, up to a third of SMEs may fail to survive within the next three months. Um, the success of SMEs is, is fundamental to any recovery. SMEs typically account for two thirds of the country's employment and half of its GDP. So at all costs, SMEs must be protected or, or we 
risk a greater systemic failure in the economy. SMEs can continue to be the spearhead of our economic development in the country's engine, but only with government support will be vital. Our recovery depends on it. But whilst all companies have had chance to uh, change and cope with unimaginable disruption, SMEs have been more susceptible. In particular, SMEs have had, uh, of course, the plunging demand and consequent liquidity, liquidity challenges. Um, OECD studies show that 50% of SMEs um, have shown significant losses and face only a few months of reserves. Supply chains, we've touched on this many times in these webinars, but inflexible supply chains and operations, typically SMEs don't have the management bandwidth to be able to react quickly to such shocks. And uh, the, the lack of bandwidth uh, results in an inability to adapt quickly. Disproportionately, SME representation in, in, in is seen in the hardest hit sectors. Many sectors such as retail, hospitality, restaurants, entertainment, construction, etc., are predominantly SME led. Again, the OECD said 60 to 70% of SMEs do business in these sectors, and these are the sectors that have been severely impacted. But how are SMEs doing right now? Simply Business surveyed uh, nearly 4,000 small businesses and self-employed people across the UK for their confidence, their SME confidence report. And um, what it showed was that um, the pandemic is costing them almost £12,000 on average. So applying this very simply to the 5.8 million SMEs in the UK, this amounts to a cost of over £69 billion. Pounds. They also asked businesses owners uh, whether they are likely to close down. 41% um, of small business owners fear their business is at risk of permanently closing because of the pandemic. 14% um, said they may close in the next three months, 12% in the next six months, and 11% within the next year. Um, already 4% have said they've closed permanently. So quite distressing numbers there. So what can be done? Uh, that, that is the question. So due to the government UK measures related to people working from home, SMEs have had to increase their use of technology and software to facilitate online meetings, information sharing, allowing employers to carry out their day-to-day -day duties. SMEs need to embrace the new digital normal and be ahead of the curve. But what is the shape of the curve? In the post COVID-19 world, digital and analytics will pay, play an increasingly important role. Physical distancing could continue and make consumers less likely to visit the traditional brick and mortar, mortar stores and a contact-free economy could emerge, raising e-commerce and automation to a new level. The implications of these trends will differ for each company, depending on its digital starting place. Um, digital and analytics leaders have an advantage today, but could quickly lose it out if players accelerate their transformation. On the other hand, laggards have an opportunity to make a, an all-in bet on digital and analytics and perhaps gain market share with smaller capital expenditures, which could be used by limiting the factors for many brands. That said, digitization is not a panacea. Companies should direct investments to areas which the highest business values lie, which may not be in sales, but rather elsewhere in the value chain. Equally important, companies should avoid gold plating, aiming instead for the fastest minimum viable digital solution that will achieve the business goal. Many SMEs have had to fight this pandemic by developing rapid e-commerce solutions, but there is a need for more innovation and digitization. Our government must prioritize SMEs most in need and 
matching them with the right technology, infrastructure, and capability building solutions. It will need to recognize that the SMEs are a vital engine for the post-crisis economic recovery. Ensuring support reaches SMEs is, is key and targeted actions will accelerate SME recovery and set them up for success. But of course, it's not just the UK that has an SME issue. If we look briefly at the Spanish economy, um, although some companies there had a better pre-crisis starting point, um, I think three key warning signs should be noted when dealing with uh, the crisis. The Spanish economy is, of course, more dependent on tourism than many other European economies. Tourism makes up over 14% of GDP uh, versus a European Union average of 9%. So it may be greatly affected by restrictions generated by COVID-19. Spain is less dependent on heavy industry or on professional and scientific activities. So there's an offset there. The Spanish business structure relies, again, on heavily on small and medium-sized enterprises. 47% of the Spanish workforce is in companies with fewer than 20 people. Smaller companies, as we just talked about in the UK, are more vulnerable to a weakened economy. Um, during the period from 2007 to 2013, for example, the number of smaller companies decreased by four times more than the companies of all sizes. So almost all sectors in Spain um, have better capital and liquidity positions than they did in 2007. And some of them may be more resilient uh, in the face of the crisis because of these structure changes. Um, but transport, logistics, automated, retail, grocery sectors um, do have lower structural levels of capital and liquidity. So um, a, a risk continues there. Okay, so coming back to uh, the UK for a second, um, we're beginning to see the, the great unlockdown, as it's being called. And um, so, okay, so we can commute. Um, but looking at uh, a slide from McKinsey, let's share my screen here. Um, what you can see here is a demand for public transportation spikes, un unsurprisingly, during the morning and evening rush hours. Uh, compared with midday, the morning rush hour can see transit occupancy increase fivefold, with the busiest lines running well above full capacity and uh, standing passengers crammed into buses and trains uh, and tubes, as we've all seen. So shifting demand away from peak times will, will be a crucial aspect if we are going to go back to the office. And of course, that is one of the key questions. Um, we're now, as we are today, um, more familiar with online activities. I'm doing this via Zoom. Um, and uh, the Zoom founders are, are now billionaires after their stock has more than doubled uh, in a three-day rally uh, in the US. Uh, the business for the business intelligent firm um, last week began trading at $21 each and uh, it ended up at uh, $42 at a peak, closing at $34. Uh, but the stock continued the next day and uh, closed at almost $45. So uh, the two founders uh, owning uh, almost 20% of uh, the, the company are enjoying um, the uh, status of being a, a stock billionaire. Uh, the, the original Zoom uh, NASDAQ IPO raised more than 900 million um, and uh, signaled some sort of IPO bounce back. Um, but um, we are, of course, in the digital transformative economy. Um, interestingly, a, a, whilst companies around the world are, are moving at speed into digital transformation, a survey was done in the US a few days after the lockdown, 
Um, and it's it's a it's a bit of a uh, sort of a smiley questionnaire. But there was a survey question which said, "Who has led the digital transformation of your company?" A the CEO. B, the CTO, the Chief Technology Officer, or C, COVID-19. And almost everybody circled COVID-19. So the post-COVID-19 digital transformation is underway. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's not a question. The answer is yes. The COVID-19 has shown that the world, something that the manufacturing industry should already know, that traditional supply chain, chains and um, manufacturing ecosystems were failing. And uh, we, we needed to shift to a more adaptable, agile solution, fully digitally enabled. The virus, like any crisis, merely under, underlined the need and the urgency to accelerate that change. So according to Forbes, because of COVID-19, manufacturing will experience five years of innovation in the next 18 months. Forbes, like many, see COVID-19 as the wake-up call for manufacturing, who need to be uh, perhaps stop talking about uh, industry 4.0, industry revolution 4.0, um, but actually doing something about it. Digital transformation has always made sense, but the adoption has been slowed as people deal with some of the overwhelming concepts and the sheer size of the task for many. And of course, to struggle, out, struggle to figure out where the value is coming from, what they should do, where is their digital dividend. But now the needs are compelling and the urgent tasks are uh, falling on transformation. Um, those that don't will likely be left behind. So um, I think there are many keys to digital transformation. Um, obviously, you need to create a digital thread right at the start of the process. Um, you need to find your, managing, your manufacturing partners and make sure that they're digitally aware and, and they are the right people for you. Ensure that you have the right digital tools too. Um, it's time to throw away those, those spreadsheets, I'm afraid. Um, insist that your own manufacturing ecosystem or your suppliers has also and is working with you on the transformation strategy. And uh, I think at the end, you need to embrace both automation and robotics, um, art artificial intelligence or machine learning is coming and developing yeah. and all of these elements are required to create an ecosystem that is digitally enabled has the visibility to model a disruption in real time um, the agility to respond to, to, to that disruption which we're seeing firsthand now and and the resilience to cope with what the world has to throw at it importantly these digitally enabled manufacturing solutions promote choice, the choice to manufacture closer to the consumer or in a lower cost environment, the choice being to manufacture onshore or allow the market to drive vendor selection. So it's coming and it's coming in all sectors, um, but it's also coming in fashion very quickly. Um, I think it's very interesting to see what's happening um, with, with Harrods who went live in February this year with uh, far-fetched platform solutions. Um, they can't uh, have their retail store open, although it is open now. Um, and this was a way they saw to serve their customers. Um, uh, this is a very quick response to innovation and there is great demand for startup innovation. Brand wonder how they can use technology to continue, um, but linking them up with 3D design, digital show, showrooms, um, it, is, it seems to be working. Um, is digital here to stay? Well, absolutely. It was growing already and it's right to accelerate. I don't think we'll be back to the old normal and uh, missing this opportunity um, um, is, is, is a one-off miss. So with that, I'm going to wrap up uh, this week's webinar. Um,
Again, the main message, if you didn't hear it, was uh, the digital revolution has come. It's speeding up. And um, whether you're an SME or a large manufacturing or distribution company, um, digital is here to stay. And uh, you need to embrace, in particular, your distribution and supply chains, because uh, without that, um, you'll be behind the pack. So thank you for listening. Um, I'm Mark Charles.